Because of the length of the last lecture, I decided to move one of the cases that was in the uh, non-consent and incapacitation section into this lecture, and it provides a nice bridge for understanding uh, something that I alluded to last time, which is the concept of intertwined elements, uh, which is a bit unusual. And so this gives us, a, you know, the discussion of rape and sexual assault law helps us, um, you know, deal with this circumstance, which doesn't arise frequently, but is is worth, you know, addressing head on and understanding uh, how elements can be intertwined in a different sort of dynamic. So the, the particular issue here is uh, the relationship between force and non-consent, which is uh, force, it, constructive or actual force, constructive meaning a threat of force, um, if that is shown, uh, then you don't need to prove non-consent. Uh, and so this way, it's a, a sufficient element for the entirety of the, those two elements. Um, and this is true in jurisdictions that either have a force requirement or not. So even if there's no force requirement, uh, defendants uh, who used force, who made threats, uh, do not get to argue that any sex act was consensual um, if a victim relented to it after the threat a force. And so this presents an unusual dynamic, but also in this, this uh, complex relationship is this idea of incapacitation. Incapacitation, which is not codified in every rape statute um, and is seemingly precluded or has an adver adverse uh, um, interrelationship with um, force, arises when a victim is unable to consent. And we typically, just through media and stuff, associate this with um, alcohol or drug consumption. So somebody is so inebriated or drunk that they cannot consent. But it, it can be defined in a variety of different ways. The Massachusetts example, there's one standard that sort of governs all these scenarios, wholly insensible. Other statutes take the approach of trying to define specific instances or types of incapacitation. So, for example, you could have a coma, um, somebody could be uh, asleep, uh, somebody could have a medical condition that renders them, um, you know, for, for a period of time unable to form consent. So one example uh, would be an Alzheimer's patient, right? Somebody who has trouble understanding and processing reality around them, even though they have you know, high functional capability. It's not like they have a low IQ or, or don't understand certain concepts. It's that their memory and brain have become so impaired that we might wonder if they have the ability to consent because they are easy manipulated or confused uh, by someone. Um, so there's a lot of different things that can fit under this umbrella of incapacitation. And I said it has sort of a complicated relationship with force. Well, if you just had a force and non-consent requirement, it would seem like incapacitation isn't even a viable theory for the prosecution unless uh, just for, for no particular reason, a defendant decided to use force on an incapacitated victim. But what happens in many incapacitated cases, particularly somebody who's unconscious, is no force at all is necessary. And so the, the law, uh, and so force won't typically be used, and it will be hard to find evidence of it because uh, the victim would be unconscious. So if the force requirement doesn't specifically acknowledge the possibility of incapacitation, it can preclude prosecutions in this area. So this is sort of a complex complex milieu of two separate general element categories and then this one type of non-consent that presents special problems or unusual circumstances here. So as I mentioned at the outset, our case of Massachusetts versus Blush, um, this is uh, incapacitation by alcohol consumption. But one of the details that's important in this case um, is the fact that it's a police officer summoned to the scene um, in order to um, address the situation of a person who's become extremely drunk, who has hit her head, um, and seems to be a bit belligerent and, and acting inappropriately. Uh, well, why is this important? Well, ordinarily, as we'll see in the next part of this chapter, uh, in incapacitation cases, victims um, have difficulty um, getting prosecution to bring these cases because of mens rea issues, uh, where a defendant can, for example, argue, I honestly didn't know they were incapacitated. In other words, yeah, I thought they'd had a couple of drinks, but they hadn't reached whatever the statutory threshold is for incapacitation. But that sort of mens rea argument is largely off the table for this defendant, because this defendant had specific knowledge about the victim's incapacitation here. Um, they were summoned for this very reason. 
And this means that instead of arguing the incapacitation non-consent uh, issue at the mens rea level, which is often more defendant friendly, as we'll see, they focus instead on the act requirement. And in particular, you know, they're saying that the standard here is, um, you know, too vague, it's unclear. Um, and they also want to argue that um, uh, whatever the standard is, uh, she did not meet it. But, you know, she has a high estimated blood alcohol content level at the time of uh, the encounter, um, they have to back, you know, estimate it based on her, how much is left their blood. So there is some range. Um, and there's no doubt that there was uh, penetration uh, because we have DNA found with a vaginal swab. And this case goes to trial and the defendant is convicted under this incapacitation theory. And so by the time we get to the high court here in Massachusetts, we, we do have, you know, jury verdict that... Um, you know, should be deferred to as far as the finding of facts. And yet, and yet, like lots of other cases, you see the court really going through the different stories here um, and really engaging with the various um, uh, parts of the defendant's story um, that seem to be wholly irrelevant as a matter of law. If we're arguing incapacitation here, does it matter that the victim might have been sexually aggressive toward the defendant while in the car? No, right? If it's incapacitation, the question isn't whether or not she said yes or she said no, right? That's a separate theory, and we'll talk in class why that theory is not um, being considered here. That's like discussion question four. But for now, if we're just focused on incapacitation, um, most of this discussion is just totally irrelevant. And the fact that the court is still engaging in it and still looking through the fact that she smoked marijuana, she had clonopin in her system, those those tell us, you know, about her incapacitation a little. But then her conduct, you know, is really not helpful to the defendant. If anything, it's just showing stronger evidence that she's incapacitated. And yet the court constructs this in a way that tries to you know, at least in my view, uh, make a more sympathetic picture uh, for a defendant here. Um, you'll also note that there is no uh, national consensus yet, despite many attempts to reform this, that say police who are called uh, to a, um, uh, a situation shouldn't be ever have sexual relations with uh, the, the people at that encounter, uh, be it a robbery, a domestic violence, whatever the, whatever the call is. In fact, police have fought across the country to even prevent um, uh, a de facto rule of people in custody. Um, being considered rape. So even if they're in the, you know, in handcuffs in the back of the squad car, um, very few jurisdictions have criminalized that as a specific instance of non-consensual sex. So this is, even though the, the police officer is defendant here, there's nothing special about that status in terms of the statutory application. Why it does matter is it gets rid of the mens rea arguments the defendant might otherwise uh, contend. And so at the end of the day here, you know, we have a lot of evidence of incapacitation, and we have a jury verdict that found enough incapacitation that the victim could not have consented. What does the court do? Well, the court does something that, you know, you might think is reasonable, right? Um, which is they look at the language of wholly insensible and decide... You know, that's it, it's hard to know exactly what that means. We looked through some of the definitions, and we looked back in this ancient Burke case, you know, and, and stuff. So at the end of the day, we just don't think it's it's a proper jury instruction on guilt here because the wholly insensible standard is just too unclear, um, and they, they can try a new trial with a different standard. You know, as I said, it sounds reasonable. There's a couple reasons why we can still be critical of the way the court went about this. One is they don't give the lower court an instruction on what other standard they should use here. And admittedly, this is a real problem, right? If we're not going to define, as the partial dissent concludes, that unconsciousness is our standard, right? Because they want a bright line. If you, if you think that there's got to be something beyond unconsciousness, meaning a person who's conscious but is too incapacitated to consent, you have to develop some sort of rule or standard that divides a person's, um, you know, status as between con they're able to consent and they're not able to consent. And this is not easy. You know, as I said, alcohol is, is a lot of these cases, but we, you know, blood alcohol level gives us a, a semblance of sort of precision. But in fact, 
people's tolerance and overall ability to consent might vary. And we, here we see interactions with other uh, substances that could heighten that or, you know, sometimes uh, limit its effects. And, uh, you know, the standard used here, holy and sensible, is, you know, one thing the court doesn't really honestly disclosed in the context, is one of the two major standards in this area. Uh, the other one is nature and consequences. So the other test, nature and consequences, is the victim at the time of the sex act could not understand the nature and consequences of their action. And neither of these are precise. Neither of these are ideal. But once you've decided that there needs to be something for intoxication, you have to try and give meaning to it. And the, the, the punt here of the high court, I think, is alarming because one of the other duties of state high courts is to develop jury instructions and it is to develop ways to communicate these things to the jury. It's also unclear whether or not this language is any more archaic or difficult to interpret than, say, dozens of other legal words and terms that we regularly use and have covered this semester. Even a reasonable person standard is in inherently uh, flexible and hard to pin down. And wholly insensible doesn't strike me as, as obviously problematic in this area, and yet the judges are going along. But this, you know, so this case ends up not being retried, like many of the others uh, that we look at, where there is a remand for new trial. But as it turns out, in this one, uh, the news reports the victim didn't want to go through this again. They'd already dealt with all this litigation, the conviction, and now to have it overturned. They just didn't see any point in going on and in truth even if you're you know say a lawyer advising her it's hard to predict what would happen at a new trial even with all these bad facts against the defendant because what's the standard going to be right the fact that you can look at a dictionary and say well there's different meanings of holy and sensible that is not a unique problem in law that is in fact the whole purpose of this criminal law class is how to examine these ambiguities what to do in these situations and yet the Massachusetts court takes an approach here, which I think is, um, you know, it, we'd legally, colloquially refer to it as a punt, right? They just basically, we're not going to solve that legal issue. Uh, we will overturn this conviction, but we're not going to solve this issue. But I, I think it's arguably even worse than that, because I think it it's sort of a false naivete that they're saying, well, this is just not the language that, you know, we want in law. And it's the simple fact is, yeah, it is. This is the type of language we see in many, many different places. And it is language that other states use. But this is a problem, right? In other words, wholly insensible might seem bad, but is nature and consequences better? Is some other alternative? This is something that scholars and activists and and you know legislators have, have looked at, and no one really has a great way to divine uh, this concept. And so this is, you know, are, are we really saying, well, this is just going to be legal, right? Because we can't come up with a, uh, a good dividing line here. Which means fact patterns like this uh, will not lead to prosecutions and convictions, and there will be uh, less deterrence as a result, um, and certainly uh, no retributive uh, moral condemnation. Okay, so this incapacitation, you know, is part of our non-consent section, but it does bleed into this issue of force because people are incapacitated. You don't ordinarily need force in the same way, and force requirements, if they do exist in a state, need to acknowledge incapacitation. Otherwise, they will preclude, say, prosecution of rape of an unconscious person uh, because no force was used. So this is something that that you need to think about when drafting laws. And at the end of this section, we're actually going to try to draft uh, a rape statute. So you want to start thinking about where the laws in these laws and their application. Okay, but let's look at force on point. Um, so the general rules about force in the context of rape um, are, one, uh, there's no universal um, agreement as to the quanta of force, but it's generally thought to be low. So any amount of force or, 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 or threat of force um, can be sufficient, but jurisdictions can vary. And as we see here in Louisiana, you can often frame even very severe threats of force as not being relevant if you want as a judge. And this, and, and we'll talk about how the court, you know, constructs a very dangerous, violent situation as something else entirely. Um, so one is it's generally thought to be a low quantum. You do see cases where, like, for example, a light choke was the famous phrase used in a, a State v. Rusk, a Maryland case. It's not clear what a light choke is. You'll sometimes see shoves, things like that. 
those can be sufficient, but it's often thought to be a jury question. So if jurors don't find that to really be forcible, uh, then um, that's their discretion. But at least it tends to go to a jurors, the juries, even if uh, the amount of force used is uh, quite low. So that's one aspect of force. The second is the force must be extrinsic. And I mentioned this uh, in our, our discussion of the Illinois case, Dimbo, uh, which is sometimes the, the sect act or the penetrative act itself is violent. Um, and so in Dimbo, it caused abrasions internally and, and some cuts. You might imagine this is a real problem, say, with, with uh, an instance where they use an inanimate object to penetrate a person, something that you know might itself have sharp edges, might be uh, of a size that necessarily causes bruising and tearing. And in those instances, the courts will generally say uh, that force is irrelevant to meeting the force requirement. Right? It could be relevant to non-consent if it's obviously something somebody would say no, but they want the force to be extrinsic to the sex act. Um, the idea here is the element should somehow be separate, even though we know evidence will overlap between them. Um, you might also think back to a case we looked at very early this semester in a uh, theft robbery case. The question was whether or not force was used when a bag was tugged um, from an old man, uh, and they were very focused on his age in that case. And you'll notice there the court was, you know, willing to say, well, yeah, you know, it could have been forcible. The witness said it was, and that seems there. They, there was no discussion of extrinsic versus intrinsic force there, because in fact that force was intrinsic to the theft act, right? It was the taking that caused uh, the forcible conduct for reasons that are a little less clear uh, but are problematic. In the context of rape, there is a lot of this discussion. So it means there has to be something extra, like pushing somebody down, um, uh, hitting them, threatening them, anything along those lines. One thing that's also excluded from force is uh, body weight alone. So if uh, the defendant is pushing somebody down, that's definitely force. But if they lean into them with their body weight, that is often thought to be, in, or I think almost always, thought to be intrinsic, right? In other words, the body comes with the penetrative act, so leaning on somebody alone won't be sufficient, even though we know in the real world somebody's body weight can uh, be incredibly forcible and um, uh, often far uh, worse than, say, a light, push or choke. Um, so these are our general uh, ideas about force, but let's look at Louisiana versus Touche. I mean, this case is, I, you know, I'm critical of all the opinions here, whatever direction they come. You'll see it the, the, the case I get to next where um, they find uh, in favor of the government. I also think there's a lot of problems. This is a hard area of law to apply law well. But this case is the most indefensible, I think, in this chapter. Um, I mean, look at the first sentence of the opinion. The state of Louisiana alleges that the defendant struck the victim with his fist, forced her to remove her clothing at knife point, and had sexual intercourse with the victim against her will. It's hard to imagine this first sentence of a case and then ending up with a overturned verdict, right? Because you're deferring to the jury. The one tip off here is the word alleges, right? Because in fact, you rarely see the word alleges in a criminal appeal because at this point we have a conviction. It's not thought to be a mere allegation anymore. So that is a, a, a sign that the court here is thinking about things in a different way and will overturn the verdict because that's a really unusual term to use here. And yet, you know, the rest of it is just so, how could this not be forcible, right? I mean, it's, he, he, it even includes the word forced her to remove her clothing at knife point, and he'd already struck her with fists. Well, the court's reasoning here is lacking. Again, you'll notice a lot of discussion of the context here that, yeah, it's part of the narrative structure, but there seems to be a judgment going on, right? Meeting at Mardi Gras, spending several nights, um, you know, the fact that, you know, the defendant told the victim she had been acting like a whore. I mean, why is that relevant? It's it's kind of that the way it's it's framed here is is problematic. So at the end, the defendant pulls out a pocket knife, and the victim testified she did not remember the knife being very close to her, but he came to her with it. Uh, the victim stated she believed he was capable of using the knife, and she was scared if she tried to get away, the defendant would catch up with her. And the jury believed that, so that should be the end of the discussion. But no, the court here seems to think because the defendant put the knife down then uh, committed the sex acts, even though he'd already hit her with fist and threatened with a knife, that that therefore made the force not contemporaneous with uh, the rape. And this is, I think, just obviously wrong, right? There are almost no cases where are, I shouldn't say almost no, but a very small number of cases uh, where the defendant holds the weapon throughout uh, the sex act. And so this is, you know, would, would eliminate the high degree of rape in any 
um, uh, uh, case here in Louisiana, and that's you know the slide, Louisiana doomed. This is this is just a crazy wrongful outcome. Now they do leave in place a lower conviction here, but if this is not aggravated rape, in other words, forcible rape here, um, it's hard to imagine what is you know is in a in right in front of these judges um there is a dissent but even the dissent is kind of similar to our cowing case way back when it's like well i would have found differently but not kicking and screaming so this case doesn't end up going to the high court of louisiana i think because the dissent is not making a bigger deal out of this the the docket of the high court in louisiana is discretionary and there's, this case doesn't go any further. And I think that's a mistake. I mean, if this is not forcible rape, it's hard to say that, you know, what should be. But this is, this is one jurisdiction. You'll notice it's nothing in the statute that indicates this, right? There's no language in the statute. I, I do indicate in the, one of the questions, the court selectively mentions part of the, the statutes here that were before the jury. They leave out language that would have made uh, far clearer uh, what the outcome should be in this case in terms of deferring to a jury's verdict. But the statute doesn't say anything about the type of force, the threshold of force. This statute is very typical. And so what we see here is sort of one perspective, you know, that's on one extreme, uh, where where force is construed with a very high threshold requirement, and even with a jury verdict, courts can you know overturn convictions with pretty much complete discretion. It's you know it's it this really opens the door for a lot of reversals. In contrast, we go to Kansas, where we see a similar statute. Language is a bit different, but again, nothing from the statute obviously indicates that either of these outcomes should occur. And here, um, the Kansas court allows uh, what is an unprecedented theory of rape uh, to result in a conviction. And um, this is uh, remarkable, right? You, you might not think of Kansas as sort of being on the cutting edge of, of law in terms of protecting rape victims. But at least in this context, we are. Um, but it's also the way the opinion's written is not necessarily ideal, right? There are a lot of things, even if you agree with the general outcome here, to wonder about in this case. So the specific um, statutory language, whoops, sorry, that the court is focused on in this case is fear, right? Which is normally what we associate with constructive force. So instead of saying actual force use, there's a fear. And the court makes a big deal about the fact that the statute here says force or fear, but fear doesn't say fear of force, right? They act like this is an unusual statutory anomaly that gives them discretion to interpret the statute in a manner that fear can be any fear, not just based on force. Um, what the, the opinion here focuses all, on all Kansas cases, Kansas statutes, and so forth. But this is not atypical language. There's a lot of other states that have similar language, and every single one in cases throughout time have always interpreted fear to mean pure force. It's not obvious that they should, but I'm just saying Kansas should. The court here should acknowledge this fact, as the Kansas Supreme Court is is really, you know, going to new ground here. But one of the remarkable things about this case is, you know, if you're going to pick one case to really, you know, change a strong consensus across the country, you would expect the facts to be egregious, meaning that this is just an, a situation that's so awful and so horrible and so meets this new way of understanding rape law that um, that it, it supports the finding. But in fact, the facts here do not rise to the level of many other cases that have been across the country where often judges just won't even let it be tried. Because what is ultimately this is being is, is that fear of blackmail, fear of reputational harm in Kansas is considered strong enough to create uh, force and therefore non-consent. But if you look at the specific facts, not saying this is right um, or legal conduct by the defendant, but the, the actual fear here is quite low under the victim's own testimony, because the victim says, yeah, you know, this is my former husband, and he did no information about, you know, um, my indiscretion at work. But on the stand, she says she's not actually really that worried if he discloses it. And it that's a very confusing fact in this sort of large scheme of, of fear. We might contrast this with, say, a case that's long been considered not criminal. It does give rise to a tort, but not a, a crime, which is... A boss who tells uh, an employee, you have to have sex with me or I will fire you, uh, 
I will ensure you never work again because this is a small contained industry and I will have you blackballed across the, the, the board. Um, I know you, you have family that's, that's like, you know, dependent on you. You have several kids and you'll basically be out in the street and starving. That's incredibly coercive, right? And that seems like it's in fact far worse than say a push that, that is considered to be force. And yet courts have said, no, that's, that's not force because it doesn't involve a physical aspect to it. That sort of blackmail, that uh, very real economic coercion has long been thought by courts, legislatures, and scholars to be outside of a rape statute. Now, some scholars have suggested we should have a rape by blackmail statute that's codified separately. Some have tried to argue this theory that it can fit with an existing rape statutes, but it's a difficult argument to make. But this case doesn't even rise in terms of the facts to that level because the victim undercuts a lot of her fear. The court here does not also give us a good standard. Should it be a subjective fear? We'll talk about maybe why I think that's probably the best way, a reasonable person's fear. Uh, if we say it's not just physical force, what else does it include, right? I mean, it clearly includes reputational harm. But does this include, say, the you know uh, teenage lovers, and one turns to the other and says, you know, we haven't had sex, and you keep saying no, and if you don't have sex with me tonight, I will break up with you. Is that rape under Kansas v. Brooks? It's possible, right? The court, you know, courts only have to decide the case before them, but the the level of guidance in this opinion for a high court, I think, is suspect because, and in fact, I've talked to prosecutors uh, who prosecute sex crimes in the state of Kansas, and a lot of them just don't know what to do with Brooks. Um, they're not sure what types of cases they can bring, what will be overturned, what will be upheld. I mean, obviously, they have to have the, the facts before them from, from victims reporting, and they have to convince a jury. But the simple fact is, even though it's been you know about six years now, there's not a lot of cases under Brooks, even though there's probably a reasonable number of fact patterns that would fit under this umbrella in the real world. Uh, there are several dissents here, and we'll talk about these in class, that have their own problems, right? So just because the majority is problematic does not mean the dissents are, are better here. Um, there are, you know, I think a lot of bad opinions all the way around. And as I said, this comes with the territory in rape law. And we want to think about why. Why is it that everyone seems to be interjecting facts and discussions and processes of analysis that you don't see in all or other areas of law, right? That's one of the things we need to think about here. And so these are sort of two different extremes on that continuum. I started with Louisiana being one, and Kansas is now in the other, right? It, it's taking a similarly structured law and interpreting it in a way that is very different, that says certainly any, any physical force is definitely sufficient, but also non-physical uh, related fear is also sufficient to meet uh, the force requirement. Of course, many jurisdictions have abandoned the force requirement entirely. Uh, this was particularly true throughout the 80s and 90s. And so many jurisdictions don't even have to deal with these problems at all. But this shows that the force requirement, which is similarly defined in jurisdictions that have it, um, and many jurisdictions have it for their highest degree of rape and then have a, a degree down, uh, which is just based on non-consent and doesn't include force. But in jurisdictions that have force, there is a wide range of opinions and applications. And you'll notice this is quite different, as I said, returning to our robbery case early on, where the court was like, well, we got a jury verdict, there was a tug, seems forcible to us because the victim was old. You know, Louisiana here is like, no, you have to just constantly repeat forcible actions throughout the sex sector. You know, we could overturn the jury verdict. And so this is this is something where I think in all of where we looked at the semester, we've seen different approaches. And we'll often read two cases where it's like one court comes out one way, another decides it's slightly different. But not to this degree. This is an instance where we have such diametrically opposed views that it makes it should make you wonder what is law doing here, right? How how can the legislature deal with a situation where whatever they put in the books can result in two extremely different outcomes? So we'll stop for there and then next time move on to mens rea.